I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in, in Singapore. And uh, uh, I'm, this is a very short trip this time, so I hope to be back soon. So the talk today is why casual games will be the king, will be the key to bringing VR to the masses. And VR obviously stands for virtual reality. Um, this is my first public talk outside. Uh, I, I left King in January, where I had been for three years. So, so uh, a lot of fun and, and a really uh, fantastic ride. Um, this is a slide that shows uh, some of the press that uh, we received in April. This is my fifth startup with Resolution Games. And I think uh, just in April, we got more press than all my four other startup got together for the duration of those 16 years that I worked with that. Um, so no pressure this time. Um, and this is us behind the scenes. Um, we are five guys right now sitting in uh, two by two square meters, basically, and uh, building on the frontiers of games. Uh, and uh, this gentleman over here in the far corner is uh, Martin Wilkans, who taught me to program uh, for the Commodore 64 in the, in the mid uh, 80s. So we go way back uh, making games together. Back then it was mostly on a hobby basis, but uh, we have also started a company called Jadestone together. It's my first uh, company after school. If you're into following uh, a small st startup and studio, you can follow us at resolutiongames.com on Facebook, where we sometimes post updates on what we're doing. Uh, but my talk today will uh, be um, about what we see of virtual reality right now and why casual games can be important for it. Um, so I'm going to, this is the agenda. VR today, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and over, over, overview of the platforms that's out there today, both on the connected side and mobiles, and look at some of the challenges and opportunities. And I'll do a, a sneak peek uh, and a world exclusive. You can see a screenshot of the first game that we're working on. Uh, but I'm not going to say very much about it, so don't get your hopes up too high. So I was born in the 70s, and I was early into games, and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And uh, this is a poster from a movie called Tron that was released in 1982. Uh, how many of you have seen the original movies? Wow, good. Uh, the, the director came up with the, the idea back in the 70s, and it's a very cool idea to be um, on so early, I think. Uh, the, this poster says, a world inside a computer where man has never been, never before now. And Jeff Bridges is the main character, and he's a game designer. So it's a really cool movie. And when I saw this back then, that was kind of the dream where you would, where you, th you saw the progression of where games could be in the future. And, and this is what you kind of hoped that, that you would be inside the game. And that's a little bit what virtual reality uh, is to me. Um, I had the opportunity to play this. How many of you have, have tried this arcade game? Uh, virtuality, none. It, one, two, cool, three. Uh, there was only 300 made, and they were very expensive. Two of them made it to Sweden, so I played this. It was released in 92. I'm one of the only ones who thought it was awesome. It was very laggy, and, and it was actually, they had several games. This was the one I played, the Virtuality Nightmare, or Darcel Nightmare. And it was a multiplayer. It didn't work as multiplayer in Sweden because we only had one of the arcade machines at the time, one given place. Um, but I, I was thinking that it would go much faster for this to become really big in, from a game's perspective. But then again, I've always been very bad at timing, starting a mobile game studio in, in the late 90s, for instance. Um, but Right now, last year, I saw the Samsung Gear VR, and that's when I felt for the first time that there is a consumer-ready product soon to be out on the market. And this is my 
old time friend Per, who is the CEO of the computer games industry as he tries out our games for the first time. And he has something that I like to refer to as the VR face. First time somebody sees uh, a game in virtual reality and they, they go like, oh, wow, this is the future, which is really awesome. But then again, people tend to, to um, uh, see something that's new and, and mistake that for value. So a short demo is not enough to, to make this uh, into something that people will have and, and care about. But this is a really cool thing. If you ask somebody who wears a headset and is somewhere in virtual reality, where are you right now? They, they stop describing the location they're in and start describing the virtual world. You can try that. It's, it's really cool. And that shows uh, one of the new uh, things that, that VR is, is bringing to games. When, when you say VR, a lot of people tend to think, and so did I, you know, that the, my end dream was that you would walk around in a game's world and it would be exactly like the real world and you can interact with any objects and, and um, you know, talk to these characters and they, they would ask back, this is from Skyrim, which is a great game, but n probably not at this point a great uh, game for virtual reality for several reasons. Um, some of the, the competitive game studios I've seen have taken this approach where they want to take the, the, the big game uh, experience right now and, and make that work in, in VR and they have been slightly disappointed where VR is at the moment. Because um, VR is great at output. You can probably make this scene uh, from, uh, from a visual point of view but you couldn't really interact in a, in a satisfying way with it. One of the problems, of course, is the mismatch between vestibular and visual system. Um, if you have played around with VR, you're very familiar with this. If you haven't, you probably uh, may not be sure what this is. This is the inner ear, and it's what uh, reacts to acceleration. Uh, and if you, your eyes are seeing something, a, a, a movement, your body and your inner ear is not f feeling the same, you get uh, nauseous and motion sick. And the bad thing with nausea is that it's, it doesn't instantly go away. Once you get properly motion sick, you stay motion sick. So we had several times at the office where we had some bug in the physical simulation of our games and it would just spin and things. And nobody wants to put the headset on because it's like instant punishment, but you still have to go through that, that testing phase. So, so we have to kind of schedule, okay, at 12 o'clock everybody has to try it. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And this is very important. This gets totally hampered the industry if there's a lot of games that come out that make people motion sick. If you get no motion sick from something, it's like eating a bad peach or something. Your, your body instantly reacts to peaches as that's not something I want to do again. So. It's very important to, to make sure that your games are as comfortable as possible. And that leads me into input. So there are several ways of, of uh, controlling um, VR today. This one is the most common and, and, uh, and most efficient one. It's the gyro. Um, so you can properly get these uh, head motions and use uh, gaze as a way of, of steering. This one is another one that I really like using the microphone. Um, then we have, this is uh, from Leap Motion, but it's de de uh, a depth camera. One thing that happens when you show people uh, VR games or, or movies is that they, they try to see their hands. So that's very intuitive that you want your hands to interact with things. And right now, that's not possible without any external peripheral. This is not likely to be included in, in um, the first iterations of VR that's coming out uh, this last next year. 
You have joysticks, of course, but that has the problem of, of uh, creating nausea if you try to move uh, your body through the system. And there is some other cool initiative. This is the Omni, uh, where you strap up to, uh, one of my friends described it as a, a giant diaper, which is not a good uh, review of the machine. But otherwise, it's a really cool thing, because you can run around on this and move, so you become less the problem with nauseous is less, but still you need to have space to put this very dedicated machine somewhere in your house. And this is a system that basically with magnetic fields uh, gives you an option to, to move things in the game world. Uh, and this is from the HTC Valve, um, which use uh, what they call a lighthouse uh, to to do basically the same thing as this, where you have something in your hand which can be positioned with very low latency and high precision. Um, currently in the market, there, there are many different hardware vendors betting heavily on VR. I've categorized them in three different... Uh, these are all connected to either your PC or to a console. This is the Oculus Rift um, one that's released, going to be released uh, first quarter of next year. So a lot of, of these are just uh, development uh, kits right now. This is the Samsung Gear VR. That's the one that we use uh, for as a target device when we program. And this is the HTC Vive, which is really cool device. You dedicate a part of your living room and within that space you can move around without any uh, motion sickness. And then you can really move in the game world and it will track exactly where you are and what uh, motions you're doing so you can look uh, around objects and things, which is super cool. Uh, but right now, it's still uh, one of the connected ones. So it has a cable attached to your computer, which you don't see when you're in the virtual world. And you have very hard time memorizing where the cable is according to your body. So all the demos I've seen with this, you have somebody standing behind you just taking care of the cable. For the very rich, you can have a own personal VR assistance. That's a nice alternative. Otherwise, you have to, to go for the, the mobile ones, where you use your own smartphone and uh, put that into a headset. And that has the big advantage, of course, of, of uh, not having any cables. Another uh, great thing is that you already have uh, the device, the, the, the majority of the cost. You've already paid for that for some other reason. Uh, I'm going to talk more about mobile VR. You're not super surprised, I guess. Um, Anything else? No, I don't think so. All right, so where will you play uh, uh, virtual reality games? Probably not in public situation. As you can see, what happens typically is your friend starts to mess with you instantly when you don't no longer are aware of what's going on outside. In this case, Kieran is, is making uh, Paul Bregel uh, smell a uh, uh, crab shell. Uh, as he's playing. Um, so I think that it's, for me right now, I think most of this, more the situation is not going to be so much the subway. It's not going to be a replacement for w those times where you play your smartphone games uh, in, in the bathroom or in a meeting under the table. It's more going to be in, in the kind of home situation. And I'm, I'm a gamer. I have been, ever since I, I saw Space Invader on an arcade machine, I still enjoy very much playing games when I relax. I don't get to do that very often these days, but it happens every now and then. This is my fiance in, in our couch back home uh, after a long day of work, relaxing with some tea. She has done the laundry, and she's mopping the floors as uh, the janitor mission in Grand Theft Auto. I thought it was very funny. Uh, but when I get the chance to play, I, I really like playing the console games. But one huge uh, thing that often happens now is that this is, for me, a lot of kind of 90s mentality on how to meet your consumers. This is an update of uh, 7.3 gigabytes 
and that happens, if you play very seldom and you go to your games, maybe you have 30 minutes to play something and it takes a lot of time to download things, and you go through these virtual buttons, which feels like typing uh, your name and password is just a super big pain. Uh, so that is something that casual games have been fantastic at uh, taking it to another level, making sure that the usability is there, that the games become very accessible. And it comes from, from this uh, uh, heritage of the smartphone. It should say multi-purpose device there, but it doesn't. It says MU. Um, which is another great thing with this. If you, for instance, happen to cut your cable to your uh, Xbox One at home, you need to go and buy a new cable only for your amusement of playing games. If you crack your iPhone or your, smart, your Samsung phone, you, you take that pretty instantly to somewhere to fix it because you're using this for a lot of things. So that is one of the great things with, with the smartphone is that it's so central in your place, so you keep, um, you keep it very close and, and uh, in a good shape all the time. So one of the, the great benefits of, of the mobile device, and this brings me back to why casual games are, are important for, for this, for the VR space, is that you need to do uh, not as big hardware investment. It says no hardware investment, that's not really true. Uh, and as I said, it's a multi-purpose device. Uh, I think the, f the free to play, the fact that you can download games without paying something up front has been a really um, big thing for new players to come into the ecosystem and, and discover games and, and discover that games are really something that can be a lot of fun. Also, uh, the fact that th the social connection with games is also important in order to broaden the target audience of games. Because one thing that is very important is that you don't want these devices, once they're bought, to end up in the attic, together with your karate suit and your exercise bike that you thought you were going to, to use, but, and you probably did the first week, but then you got tired of it. And one thing that we learned from mobile games and, and casual games is that retention is everything. And retention is a great way of actually measuring if this is something that's valuable for the consumer or not. So when I speak about cla um, casual games in this category, I don't necessarily speak about the match three games and, and the classic uh, categories of, of casual games that you think about in, on smartphone and, and PC. I think you still need uh, great game concepts that really fit VR and, and makes the most out of that platform. One great thing on the attic thing is that it's not only going to be games that's driving the sales of the goggles. It's, uh, Hollywood is betting really hard on VR. And this is Arnold Schwarzenegger testing VR in, in Total Recall. That didn't really work out well for him. but. Uh, there's also a lot of cool apps. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, medical um, usage for virtual reality. Um, a lot of people are working on the next Skype killer um, on, on social apps. Um, if you ever get the chance to use Tilt Brush, you should, because it's mind-blowing in, in so many ways. Uh, and it's available, it's a, it's a you paint in the 3D environment, uh, and you can do it on HTC Vive, and it's, it's a really uh, super cool experience. So, if you look at this slide, this is a graph showing uh, from the launch date, and it's showing some different platforms. So these very linear platforms here are all consoles, so Wii, uh, uh, PS3, and Xbox 360. And they continue to grow, but it's a very linear growth, and they are still targeting the same very hardcore users. Uh, and these two curves are Android and iOS uh, that today are selling one and a half billion devices each year. 
And I think that the great opportunity for VR games is in this space where Oya tried to, to go and, and uh, Wii U also tried to, to get the gamers that just discovered how fantastic games can be and, and want to have a console-like experience but is not willing to, to fork up the money or go through the... They're not the hardcore gamers that, that can use... Uh, uh, gamepad to type passwords, etc. So I think there's a great opportunity here for, for VR games. And uh, one of the, the great unique things with VR is, is an unprecedented sense of presence, that you are actually there. People describe it as time traveling or, or uh, teleporting. Um, Michael Abrash, who's the chief science officer at Oculus, said, presence is VR magic. And, and uh, I, I truly agree with him on that. Another thing that's great in VR is characters. You can really get kind of emotionally attached to characters that is in that world. Uh, do you remember this segment of The Matrix when he describes the Matrix to, to the main person is saying, unfortunately, nobody can be told what Matrix is. You have to experience it for yourself in a very cool and slow fashion. I think uh, virtual reality is a little bit like that. Uh, and I'm now going to, to uh, show you what we're working on currently at uh, Resolution. So, this is a screenshot from the game that we're working on. I'm not going to tell you what type of game it is right now, unfortunately. But I will say that this is uh, rendered on mobile, current generation mobile phones. Um, and it's, it's running in 60 frames per second uh, without dropping, which is very important when you're uh, moving around in a game, game world. And I think that the graphical quality is, is somewhere where an, a user would just expect a game to be at. And um, I see a very bright future because smartphones continue to be uh, faster continuously. Right now you can render approximately 50,000 triangles on, on a current generation smartphone um, compared to several millions on a PC. So there is a big difference on performance but you can still do really cool scenes. And this is nowhere near 50,000 triangles, probably around six to 10 right now. Um, so to summarize, there's two different branches of VR. I know that, uh, for instance, uh, Michael Abrash has uh, said that PC is going to be where it's the best. I don't agree with him. I think mobile is a very exciting thing for mass market. Um, both are awesome for games, that we can conclude. And presence is, is the magical ingredients of VR. But right now, content is what's needed the most. And, and we have an important uh, responsibility to, to, to bring VR to the masses. And that concludes this for me. We are uh, still looking for, for great people at Resolution Games. So if you're interested in a career in, in Sweden, in VR, you can talk to me after the show. Thank you very much. I'm also here for questions, by the way. Thanks a lot, Tommy. Um, questions? I'm sure you have a lot of questions about VR. Uh, hi, sir. I'm I'm an artist from Synergy 88. Uh, we were doing a, a horror demo for Samsung VR. So um, we were having a hard time uh, incorporating uh, a good gameplay for our game. So uh, can you suggest any type of, uh, for example, uh, you are thinking about a hidden object or some kind of uh, other uh, gameplay styles. So can you uh, at least uh, guide us? I think, uh, as you said, I mean, hidden, hidden object is obviously one of the, the things that work really well in this type of world, when it's easy to, 
to look around and take your time. And typically, I would say what I've seen has worked most is, is rather slow paced things where you, where you can take your time and, and um, look around. I also prefer darker scenes to brighter scenes, especially right now if you look at mobile VR, it's, it's not very good at, at contrast, right? If you have something white next to something black, you get a lot of ghosting and things. So um, those are some of the things that I, I think of instantaneously. I know it's so early days in VR, I think uh, you still have to experiment a lot in order to find uh, good game mechanics. I definitely think that the most interesting ones are where where the interaction is pretty simple, but but it's still uh, so. I think hidden object is a great example of something that would work. Um, but then again, you probably want to take out the, the timing aspect that's very common in in hidden object games, where you need to do it uh, in in a fast time in order to perceive. It's not very nice to move your head fast, so you need to kind of optimize for people to slowly take their time and walk around. I think that. For me, one of the great things that I, I like is the, the relaxing aspect of, of uh, VR. Maybe not perfect for a horror game, though. <laughs> but but it's, you know, if you build up suspense, it's great to do that by letting people take their time and just messing with sounds. And, and, and uh, yeah, no, I look forward to, to try out what you're building. Question down there? Hi, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> outside of Tilt Brush, what would you say um, are the most impressive demos or games you've played in, in VR and, and why? Uh, well, there is a couple of uh, uh, cool ones, obviously. W one that I personally like the best that I play most is uh, Bomb Squad. It's actually made for, for, for uh, iPhone or, or Android phones originally. and, and and poured it over, but poured it very nicely. And, and the, th the thing that I like about it is so many degrees of polish there. It doesn't really utilize VR super much. And uh, there are other games that, that does that better, but, but you know, all the details, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of um, polish and, and details into games, and, and uh, that makes a huge difference. Um, so that's typically what I like to see, and I haven't seen that much of that yet. So, hope to see more. Any other questions? I have one question. <laughs> yeah? Um, regarding monetization and how like the cost to develop a game on VR might be like higher than normal cost for to develop a, like an ordinary game. Um, what kind of monetization do you think we should have and is it going to be like would it fit to any monetization type that are right there? I'm gonna uh, bet on on kind of free to play uh, on, on this platform. It's not not all of them are gonna have that originally, but I th I definitely think that that's where where games are going, and that's the best way of of uh, presenting something for a consumer where they can download something and you charge for things in the game that makes sense for that particular game. Um, so, th and, and that varies so much. But I know that a lot of other people are, are taking the, the kind of premium approach, but I think that's connected to uh, the, the console type of thinking that I personally prefer not to. And, and, and there's a, a, people can be very passionate about free to play being very bad for the gaming industry, but you can implement that so many, so many great ways. It doesn't have to look exactly like someone successful have made it before. Um, it can can fit your game. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, the, the two Swedish guy called Mediocre, uh, who made Smash Hit, and uh, the recently out with does not commute. Uh, which is a great game as well. And they've, they have another take on free-to-play, which is very nice, so you just pay once. Um, cool, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you. One more question there. One last question.
Thanks. Uh, is it possible to connect the VR tech with uh, sports equipment, such like a bike or any other else? Um, yeah, uh, a regular bike wouldn't be super good, I think. So that would be very dangerous if you couldn't see cars and things. Uh, that's better for AR, which is another very interesting area and one of the reasons I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, VR. But when it comes to exercise bikes, which I, I'm assuming that you're referring to? Is that what you meant? Like, like connecting VR to an exercise bike? Or did you mean a real bike? Maybe we can discuss later. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think time is up. Yeah. All right. But yeah, uh, as I was with, with exercise equipment, at least, uh, one very interesting thing is that they are now coming out with kind of Bluetooth connected uh, so you can connect uh, to regular uh, gym equipment. And that's a super interesting uh, area as well. So, so if that was what you were referring to, I'm, 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 I'm very uh, excited about that. And I've always dreamt about uh, taking games to, to exercise equipment. Okay. Cool. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.